Whenever someone says, well, maybe now it's different, this is the most dangerous line of reasoning in the world. What the dot-com people said to Warren Buffett in the late 1990s, what people said about Florida condo speculators in 2006, that maybe now people can just own 10 houses with no equity and they go up 10% a year, and eventually they're paying $4 million for a garage on $50,000 of income, and maybe now it's just different. Um, there are just things that uh, uh, get stretched to a point of absurdity. David Bonson returns to the show. He is a managing partner of the Bonson Group. He was on the show last year. We talked about his outlook for stocks, bonds, yields. You can revisit that interview in the link down below. David, welcome back. I think two weeks before the election, everyone wants to know from a, from a reputable large fund manager like yourself, how are you positioned ahead of either a Trump or Harris victory, or does it not make a difference to you whatsoever? It doesn't make a difference to us whatsoever. And there's a number of reasons why. First of all, the way in which we invest capital at my firm on behalf of clients is very uh, purposely rooted to a philosophy that does not require uh, the wind to be blowing a certain direction. We believe that uh, companies growing free cash flow and returning a greater percentage of that free cash flow with investors is a very bipartisan um, mm. uh, investment methodology. Now, what the impact of the election may be on certain sectors is always of interest to us, but you can't position for that in front of an election when it is a 50-50 election proposition. So after the election, is there a possibility, and by the way, not just the presidential election, but getting an idea of the legislative result as well? What are the congressional um, implications in terms of the Senate and the House? Because in theory, I'm making up an example, but if we thought, well, Vice President Harris is going to be terrible for health care, and Vice President Harris just won, therefore we got to rethink our health care well, that isn't quite the way it works if she doesn't have control of the Senate, for example. So because we are reasonably uh, optimistic that the Republicans are going to have some majority in the Senate after the election, um, there's a divided government scenario that just doesn't motivate us to go make big changes in the portfolio. Well, the short term risk arguments against either candidate are as follows. Harris would be bad short term for the stock markets. We could see a sell off if she wins because she wants to raise capital gains taxes. Markets don't like higher taxes. We're going to see a wave of selling off. If Trump wins, he may introduce more tariffs. And on top of what Biden already has, that's bad for markets, too. Do you buy into either of these arguments? Uh, no, you cannot raise capital gain taxes in this country as the president. You have to have Congress sign it into law. Congress has to pass the law. President has to sign it into law. There is absolutely no chance that if uh, Kamala Harris is president, that they are going to tax unrealized capital gains. Um, even if the Democrats were to hold on to a 50-50 type Senate, there are probably 10 Democrats that would vote against that. So yes, in theory, the argument of this candidate will raise taxes could be bad for markets. But um, the political reality here is such that most of the things the people running for president can threaten to do can't be done. Uh, I will argue that President Trump's threats on tariffs are very possibly volatility enhancing. Mm -hmm. um, so could we prepare, as we saw in 2018, from the uncertainty of how certain threats of tariffs versus actual tariffs versus negotiated transactions play out? Could that the uncertainty enhance volatility? It very much could, but that is not something that we would shy away from. So no, neither of these things make us want to limit the stock exposure for those reasons. There may very well be other reasons too, but it would not be about who the occupant of the White House is. So politics aside, what are you looking at for long-term positioning? Um, we The problem with the stock market right now is not the president or the future president or the past president, it's valuation. It's extremely expensive. And so cap-weighted index investors are paying a very high price for this our earnings growth. The good news is they've been getting the earnings growth and the earnings growth has outperformed expectations for the last several years coming out of COVID. The bad news is is extremely priced in and then some to a point where now we're looking at something about 15% earnings growth next year, which is very possible, but also very um, optimistic. And with that, you're paying 22 times next year's earnings. So um, a full standard deviation and then some above 
historical mean for uh, earnings valuation. That's the problem. But for us, um, being dividend growth investors, we tend to run at a much lower beta and certainly a lower PE, a uh, lower valuation. There are certain things in our portfolio that we think are a little richer than normal, but by no means some of the grotesque excessive valuation that you see in some of the big tech and mag seven names. Before we continue with the video, let me tell you about a way that you can protect your data privacy, a very important topic. Data breaches are becoming more frequent and it's getting harder to control who has access to your personal information. Just last month, a data broker breach exposed 2.2 terabytes of personal data from one third of the U.S. population. That is why Delete Me, today's sponsor, is more important than ever. It helps you remove your personal information, like your name, address, phone number, and more, from data broker websites that buy, sell, and trade your data. The process is simple. Simply submit your information, and within seven days, you'll receive a report showing exactly where your data was found and removed. Delete Me continues to monitor and remove your data all year long. Get 20% off of all U.S. plans today by heading over to the link in the description down below or simply scan the QR code here on the screen to get started. Use my promo code David Lin at checkout. Join thousands of people who trust Delete Me to protect their online privacy and take control of your data today. Yeah, the S&P 500 is uh, trading at a higher multiple, P multiple than uh, the historic average. But let me let me just throw something out at you, David, just as a thought exercise. What if we were to shrink the history that we look at instead of the last 50 years? Just look at the last five years. Maybe that's the new trend. Maybe there's valuations inflation we have to take into account going forward. Yeah, and, and this is the most dangerous. You're asking hypothetically, so I'm not picking on you, yeah. but this is the most dangerous line of reasoning in the world. <laughs> Whenever someone says, well, maybe now it's different, May, like the, the, what the dot-com people said to Warren Buffett mm -hmm. in the late 1990s, what, I ha what, what people said about Florida condo speculators in 2006, that maybe now people can just own 10 houses with no equity and they go up 10% a year and eventually they're paying $4 million for a garage on $50,000 of income and maybe now it's just different. Um, there are just things that uh, uh, get stretched to a point of absurdity. And here's my uh, uh, belief. Right now, for some of these companies trading at 50, 60, 70 times earnings, um, they have earnings growth. So you don't have to literally wait 50, 60, 70 years to get your money back. But at a 15-time multiple, which is lower than historical average in the S&P, it is extremely unlikely that you would find someone who says, I would take on the risk of this company, all the things that can go right and wrong in the next 16 years, just to get my money back. Assuming they distribute out 100% of earnings just to get my money back in 16 years. Nobody thinks that way. Now you get earnings growth year over year that are used to justify it. The rate of earnings growth will begin going down, not up. So I understand the argument, but the notion that we have moved the historical mean uh, valuation to 22 times earnings or in the technology sector, 40 times earnings, these are conversations that always precede a bubble bursting. Interesting. So what does high valuations mean for you, practically speaking, as a fund manager? Is it time to sell? Do you just hold? Do you just not buy more? Is it time for capital rotation into other things? Well, because we're dividend growth investors, we don't have to go worry about trying to get expensive stocks to get more expensive. We're trying to get companies that are growing earnings to continue growing earnings and continue distributing in the form of dividend. And so how do we know something is very expensive? I'll give you an example. I've owned Walmart most of my career. We made 650% in Walmart on a price basis alone, not counting dividend. We're selling the stock. We've already sold it in non-taxable accounts. We're selling it in taxable accounts in uh, 70 days, and they've done nothing wrong at all. They've grown earnings yet again, and they've grown the dividend every single year since they went public. They went public in 1973. I was born in 1974, so therefore I tell people Walmart has grown the dividend every year of my life. However, they are up 46% in 12 months, and that's mm. pushed a yield that our dividend at cost is 10% per year but it's yielding 1.1% now because the stock price has gotten so expensive. Well, what's so an my acceptable long answer dividend to your yield? short question is that's yeah. how we measure valuation. 
when the current mm -hmm. dividend yield has gotten so low, despite their efforts to grow the dividend, the price is simply ahead of itself. What, what's the cutoff for you? Below a certain yield, you say to yourself, that's no longer a high dividend yielding stock. Um, well, again, we're not high yield. We want growth of yield, but it's okay. when it's below the S&P is a deal breaker. So when mm. the yield is below that of the overall market, it's a deal breaker. We prefer it to be double the S&P uh, at purchase for basically every company. Double the S&P yield is only 2.5%. Um, but if a stock comes below 25 we won't necessarily sell it, but we'll weight it lower. But if it, uh, and again, when I say it comes below two and a half because of price appreciation, the income is still growing. So we have we have companies that have a yield right now of 3% if you were buying it, but our yield is 25% based on what we paid for the stock. Um, but below the S&P, we can't keep the stock, no. If you're looking for uh, dividend growth, is it fair to assume that you prefer low beta stocks we don't prefer low beta stocks. We just get low beta stocks. It's a great question, but I want to answer. Low beta is not what we're after. Low beta is what ends up happening because most companies in a position to grow the dividend year over year have a business model that is more balance sheet uh, stable, that has lower leverage in their um, financial structure, uh, has a, um, a revenue model that's more repeatable, and therefore is very likely to have less volatility and therefore be a lower beta name. We have higher beta names, but um, dividend growth often lends itself to lower beta. But but again, we're looking for the dividend growth. You know, the old expression, you come for the dividend growth, stay for the low beta. Now, going back to valuations, uh, let's just take a look at tech, for example. You're right. Earnings have driven prices. Looking ahead, earnings may depend on whether or not the economy is going into a soft or hard landing. What's your outlook there? On, on whether or not earnings will what? I missed the last part. A soft or hard landing for the economy. What's your outlook on the economy? Soft or hard landing? Yeah, it's we have a humble outlook uh, that we believe that there is a very strong possibility of a soft landing and even a soft landing that looks like a no landing, that they're just simply... Um, almost ends up being no hangover, but that's very unlikely historically. So we want to stay humble to where there are soft patches in the data. The soft patches are not there in labor right now. Um, they're not there in real wages. Uh, there are so far reasonably optimistic signs around corporate profits, real wages, and jobs. Where there is mixed data, is obviously with housing, the inability to unfreeze the housing market. I don't care at all what happens to house prices, but the lack of activity in housing is uh, a reasonably important part of economic activity. And then uh, manufacturing has certainly slowed. And a lot of the factory construction that was done has not yet led to greater manufacturing uh, productivity leading me to believe that there's a lack of laborers. There's not a lack of jobs, but a lack of workers. So there's mixed data and, and these things can change. And if the Fed ends up not easing quickly enough as a lot of variable rates uh, reset in, in levered loans, commercial real estate, and the bond market, that would end up creating contractionary effects. But so far, the Fed got away with an awful lot of tightening because it wasn't really tighter because people just simply weren't paying the higher rates. That's a good point. Let's talk about uh, outlook for rates. Now, the Bank of Canada today, we're speaking on the 23rd of uh, October, just cut by 50 basis points. Do you think there's a race to the bottom around the world, central banks around the world? Well, with currency, there certainly is. But um, I, I think that you can look at the way different central banks are handling their own monetary policy, and they don't have a lot of choice but to follow the Fed. There, there are none that are going to be able to lead the Fed. And I think some would prefer to go slowly in lowering their policy rate, uh, but they simply can't handle the stronger currency that it would create if the Fed is easing at a much faster pace than they are. So that's what you'll see with Lagarde and, and the uh, ECB. Uh, it's what you'll see, what you will see with uh, Canada. China's got its own stuff going on with um, their housing market and their monetary policy objectives. Um, and, and then uh, Bank of Japan, of course, is in a totally different position, having come from negative rates to barely positive rates. 
So, yeah, there's a race to the bottom in the sense that um, everybody would rather have a weaker currency than a stronger currency. There's no question about that. Well, what is your expectation for the uh, for the Fed? How many rate cuts could we expect into 2025? Well, uh, my belief on this is that the Fed follows the market. The market doesn't follow the Fed. And so um, right now, the market is pricing in uh, three to four cuts, uh, the, another 100 basis points beyond the additional 50 they're expecting this year. So 50 this year, another 75 to 100 next year. And I think that the market's probably right about that. Um, I think the Fed would like to do a little bit more than that. Um, but if the economic data is not weak enough, they'll have a hard time rationalizing it. The, um, the question is really housing, that the Fed knows that there is not any inflation anywhere right now, year over year, other than trying to clear out housing, but that sellers are unwilling to sell 3% mortgages to buy 7% mortgages. And so they have to get mortgage rates back down into the fours or fives. And that's not going to happen in a year. It's going to take a little while. But that's the that's really, I think, the secret driver of monetary policy right now um, is getting a couple hundred basis points out of borrowing cost for businesses before they reset at higher rates, like I mentioned, and then trying to unthaw this frozen housing market. Well, uh, the housing market is is very uh, frothy right now, according to some people. Look, uh, going back to politics, I'm not trying to make this a political talk, but Kamala Harris wants to build 3 million homes. Okay, so is the future of housing to the downside if politicians are talking about more supply as being a priority? Well, the, I think I know what you mean, but the problem is I vehemently disagree with the premise that there's anything downside about lower prices. Housing is a place to live, and um, it is not a speculative investment. And you, uh, uh, the better thing for housing, the upside from the way I view it in terms of a healthy and sustainable economic situation is to have affordability. Uh, right now, artificially constraining supply may very well put a bid in for homes of baby boomers, but it is a preposterous economic solution for society. So um, I would very much like to see housing prices normalize. I don't need the government to say what a house should cost or shouldn't cost. Um, and that's not a political statement. It's a very economic mm -hmm. one. Uh, I, I own four homes. I, I, I have no vested interest in housing being cheaper. Um, my kids are teenagers. I'm not looking to go try to buy houses for my teenagers right now. But when I say houses should be cheaper, it's because there is an affordability crisis. So people with $150,000, $200,000 of income can't afford to buy a reasonable middle-class home. It's not sustainable. Kamala Harris can't build 3 million homes. We don't have a deficit of 3 million homes because of the federal government. We have a deficit of 3 million homes because of state and local government. So clearing the um, impediments that are zoning and environmental and and approval regulatory based, that is going to unfortunately take something a lot more than just Washington, D.C. The, the, the big question regarding affordability is whether or not it will ultimately impact consumer spending. Now, retail sales came in uh, last week, new highs. Um, be expectations. The longer term trend that I've heard is that millennials are starting to become at the age where they're starting families. They're going to switch their spending from discretionary to the nest to necessity spending as their families actually come to fruition. Spending patterns and affordability. How do you see those trends playing out in the medium to long term? Well, it's why when people believe that high housing prices are good for the economy, I don't think they understand how economy works. If you're spending 28% of your disposable income on your house payment, then there is 72% that's going to your restaurants and your vacations and your apparel and other elements of household spending. This is one of the great blessings of middle class um, uh, economy in America over the last 50 years is the percentage we spend on food and gas has come way down. But the percentage of our wallet that we spend on housing has come way, way up. And that comes from something. So if all of a sudden someone has to spend 50% of their income on their rent payment or house payment, that's great for the landlord or owner of the home, but it is not great for the restaurants down the street that are getting less patronized. 
-hmm. So there's a zero sum fallacy in the way a lot of people think about this. Um, I have no fear about the American consumer's appetite to spend. I mean, it's the great flaw of Keynesianism is they just do not understand that human beings do not need to be told to want things. They want them, and as long as they have credit, they're pretty much going to go get them. The problem is the production side, is we have to produce more goods and services. That pushes prices lower, and it creates new opportunity for growth, for innovation, for a higher standard of living, for a higher quality of life. So my concern is not on the consumer, um, but it is on the production side of the economy. Finishing off on the economy, Looking ahead, we're looking at potentially a widening deficit under either a Trump or Harris win. Um, this has been projected by uh, several think tanks, including the Penn Wharton study. Uh, down the line, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, is also projecting debt to GDP to hit more than 122% by 2034. Widening deficit, widening debt levels, higher interest outlays. What does this mean for valuations for stocks, return on equity in general? Well, first of all, the higher debt is assured, and I say that um, very uh, uh, sadly. Higher deficits are assured, and I say that very sadly. Higher interest expense is not assured, because that's one thing we've learned from uh, history, is that the uh, cooperation between the central bank and treasury is a political given. Um, that as debts and deficits grow, the accommodation and enabling comes in the bond market as the central bank puts downward pressure on interest rates. And besides about an 18-month period or 24-month period over the last several years, that's been the norm since 2008 when our deficits blew out and our debt to GDP went from 60% to 100%. And when we had 60% debt to GDP, we were paying more in interest than we were when we had 100% because rates were at the zero bound. And uh, Japan has kept their interest rates at zero for 30 years, uh, despite 250% debt to GDP. So I believe that it kind of gives you a backdoor answer that yes, higher debt, yes, higher deficits, but no, not higher interest expense because the central bank will have to intervene. And I don't say this as a positive thing. I say it as a descriptive thing. What does it mean to stocks? Um, it puts a lot of pressure on companies to grow earnings and not be dependent on a growing PE ratio back to valuation. An environment like that, um, real actual stewards of free cash flow get rewarded and speculators get punished. If the argument is that central banks need to issue more money to potentially pay off the debt, does that not mean a more stimulative economy overall, which may be good for risk assets? It, it can mean an artificial stimuli to risk assets for a short period of time. But as we learned in Japan, you can't stimulate just by lowering the cost of capital. Producers do not make decisions only on what it costs them to borrow. But there has to be an opportunity of, an, uh, of something that they view as being opportunistic, a good investment to put a shovel in the ground for. The greater percentage of economic resources in the economy going to service government debt, the less economic opportunity there is. And so you put, this is what we mean by financial repression. You can boost up the value of incumbent assets, but you're not creating new assets. So the economy doesn't get the growth it needs if all you got was a more expensive Apple and Google. Well, what you need is a new Apple and a new Google. And that's, to me, the challenge that we face. Um, it's an a economic term I write about all the time at DividendCafe.com, which is my weekly investment writing called Japanification. That's what I think America is living in. Uh, I'm 50 years old, and I think we're going to be living in it for the rest of my life. Japanification, just, just to close off of this, what what what? Can you elaborate on that? You mean it's where you are deflation? using stim you're using fiscal and monetary stimulus to try to address problems with economic growth. And the more fiscal and monetary stimulus you use, the greater challenges to economic growth you create. So you create a vicious cycle right. where the patient needs more and more medicine and the medicine is working less and less. How likely yeah. can America actually experience what Japan saw in the early 90s, which is to say deflation, not just disinflation, outright deflation, high savings rate because of deflation, and 
like you said, stimulus that didn't work, stagnating economy, the Nikkei didn't return to its highs until 20 years later. Um, I think that um, in the category description, it's not just that it's inevitable we'll experience it, but that we have been experiencing it. But but at the magnitude, I'm very skeptical, at least for the time being. Our real GDP growth in our country for 70 years was 3.13% from 1946 to 2007. Um, we are uh, right now averaging half of that for 15 years. So we are not in deflation. Um, we have a very different demography in our country, um, different uh, economic productivity than Japan. And, and that is a, a, a blessing for America. But we are living off of half of our real economic growth output now. And I see continued downward pressure and the bond market obviously does. The fact that you have a 10-year a, a basically around 4%, if you believe you're going to get 2% inflation, then the nominal GDP uh, assumption is that you're getting about 2% real GDP growth. We've averaged over three. So that's what I mean by Japanification. Um, look, candidly, if we're getting 4% nominal GDP growth, that's a lot better than 3%. And, and that's where I worry that we'll go is if you're getting one and a half percent inflation and one and a half real GDP growth, that's what we got for all the pre-COVID years after the financial crisis. And that uh, takes its toll. The rich get a lot richer, the middle class do not get richer, and it creates a lot of social angst in society. Uh, that's my final question, actually, is what the bond markets are pricing in, in terms of inflation. Take a look at my screen here. This is the 10-year. Um, huge jump from just a few weeks ago. This is the two-year. Uh, it didn't move up as much over the last month or so, but it's still on uh, a flat, if not upward trajectory. Why are bonds both short end uh, yields, rather short end and long end, kind of inching up? What are they pricing in? Well, again, uh, they're only right now inching in, uh, inching up four percent in, in the ten year, and inflation expectations didn't go up. You can look at the tip spreads, so mm -hmm. that means that they're looking at real GDP growth being a little better than they thought three months ago where there was a few worries about unemployment ticking up, about the GDP growth underwhelming. The Atlanta uh, GDP now looks a little better. The uh, uh, weekly jobless claims have stabilized a bit. So 4% is a way to basically say 2% inflation, 2% real GDP growth over 10 years. Um, but all of that increase from 370 or 365 up to 4 that's all basically in real expectations, not, not uh, inflation expectations. So are, you, are, you, are, you, are you bearish bonds? Is this trend going to continue? No, I would be very bullish bonds there uh, because, mm. um, the, the, like I just said about Japanification, we are not mm. going to get to trend line economic growth. With $35 trillion of debt and either pre president adding another $1 to $2 trillion a year to it, um, we will not get back to 3% real GDP growth. So there is some ceiling in place for uh, bond yields where nominal GDP growth is 4% or less, in my view. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. Where can we learn from you? I, I, I know you mentioned you have a, your own media, you have a book as well. Yeah, dividendcafe.com is the best place where people can stay in touch with my weekly investment writing. And from dividendcafe.com, they could link around and you know see all the video appearances and, and other information about what we're doing at our firm. We'll put the link down below, Dividend Cafe. Thank you very much, David. Good to see you again. And thank you for joining the program. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow David in the link down below.